I thank you all. Thank you for joining in today. Uh, in this 21st talk in our series organized by the teachers against the climate crisis. My name is Nagraj Adwe. It's on understanding carbon neutrality, carbon climate neutrality and net zero emissions. Uh, before we start on on the subject today, uh, the teachers group would like to express solidarity with the ongoing farmer struggle uh, against the farm laws for greater state support for agriculture and agricultural prices and against the deepening corporatization of Indian agriculture. Uh, but the talk itself about, about the group, I might say that we are possibly the only group of our kind in India. We are non-party and non-funded, focusing on various aspects of the climate crisis. And today's talk is taken in a context about five years after the Paris Agreement was signed. And countries with a five-year NDCs are meant to submit more ambitious commitments this year. A few of them have made formal submissions, but as we know, a number of them have recently made new pledges of net zero emissions, of carbon neutrality, and Japan, Korea, the UK, and possibly the most significantly China. And it's also sort of anticipated that the next US president too may announce a net zero target. So what does net zero actually mean? Does it include natural sinks like the oceans? Or does it only refer to anthropogenic interventions? Does it cover just CO2 or does it also cover other greenhouse gases? And the greater possibility of greater carbon sequestration in soils, what does net zero imply for key sectors such as agriculture? So sort of shed light on these key questions, we have, we couldn't have anyone better than Professor Miles Allen, who is a professor of physics, a professor of geosystem science and leader climate research program at the University of Oxford. His work, he focuses mainly on how human and natural influences on climate contribute to observe changes in climate change and risk of extreme weather. He is the coordinating lead author of the IPCC's landmark report, Global Warming 1.5 Degrees of October 2018. And he also served on the IPCC's third, fourth, and fifth assessment report. All of us have sort of benefited from this collective research output that he has often led. Before I pass it on to him, I'd also urge readers and viewers to glance at a recent paper published last April in the Environmental Research Letters of the co-author on the likely frequency, it's on the Uttarakhand floods, and it's on the likely frequency of such a rainfall event under 1.5 and 2 degree Celsius warming scenarios. And if I've understood the paper right, it argues that a once in a hundred year event of its kind that took place in June 2013 would occur once every 23 years in a two degree world. And before I pass it on to him, I just say about the format of today's program, he will speak for about 40 or 45 minutes. And after which we'd open it out for your thoughts, questions and comments in the chat box. So I could reach out to him, so we're encouraged to do so. Thank you once again, Professor Allen, for agreeing to speak with us today. And over to you, thanks. Well, thank you very much, Nagraj. Um, and uh, it's a pleasure to be talking to you today. Um, and thank you very much for the invitation. Um, I was going to uh, share a few slides um, on the topic of understanding uh, carbon and climate neutrality. Um, I was recently talking to a, uh, I think somebody fairly senior in the process behind China's uh, recent announcement of a carbon neutrality target for, for 2060. And uh, uh, she said, uh, when I was asking her, why did you go for carbon neutrality rather than climate neutrality when the European Union is, is talking, enjoying talking about climate neutrality as its uh, mid-century goal? And uh, uh, she replied to me very tactfully, uh, well, we thought we'd go for carbon neutrality because we knew what it meant. Um, and it immediately occurred to me that that might be the reason that Europe is going for climate neutrality as well. Um, Europe is quite keen on rather vague terms where it's not entirely clear what they mean. So um, I think it is important for us to, you know, with all these pledges being made, um, all these uh, people, people making a, a lot of uh, press about the fact that they're pledging net zero emissions, climate neutrality, carbon neutrality. I think it is important for us to, to take a moment and, and ask ourselves, what do these terms actually mean? Um, and how do they relate to our long-term goal of stopping global warming? So that's what this talk is about. Um, it's, it's important. I mean, I, I, I'm not suggesting, of course, for a minute that these pledges are not 
good news. Of course, they're good news. Um, but I think in order to keep the momentum going, we are going to have to be clear on what we mean by these things, uh, because if sort of vagueness leads can lead to confusion and ultimately disillusion with the process. So I think it's it is we do have an opportunity at the moment to clarify what what's going on uh, in hopefully in the run up to COP26 next year. So to explain what I'm talking about, I'll, I'll just share a few slides with you now. Um, by the way, I'm uh, now graduate. I'm, I'm trusting you to interrupt me if anything goes wrong uh, or if you um, can't hear me or if my sh uh, sharing goes wrong. Um, yeah, but sure. uh, uh, so I'll just um, uh, aim to share uh, uh, my first desktop. There we are. Um, am I successfully sharing the yes, yes, desktop? Good. good. And uh, so, so that's where I'm going. So, um, right. So, so that's my, my title. Um, and the context of this um, is, of course, what is driving global warming at present. Um, and if you want to see a sort of up to date uh, assessment of the current level of human induced warming, and uh, where it's going and how fast it's rising. You can look at globalwarmingindex.org. It's a small website that we maintain at the Environmental Change Institute. And uh, this is where it was last February. I haven't updated them, but it's, it's kept up to date on the website. Um, but as you can see here, there's um, several lines on this. First of all, those black dots, the sort of fuzzy line, that's monthly observations of global temperatures from the four main data sets. And we've just actually last week had a revision announced to one of these data sets, which will probably result in a further upward revision of these observations. So uh, we're, we're looking to incorporate those new observations into this uh, multi data set average um, coming up soon. Um, the uh, blue line shows the contributions to global warming for to changes in global temperatures from natural drivers like explosive volcanoes or solar variability. Um, the little inset panel there shows you variations in the power output of the sun since uh, the 1980s. And you can see that's, that's basically as long as we've been monitoring it. And you can see there is uh, a small variation. Those are you know, barely um, well under 1%, uh, tenths of a percent variations in the power output of the sun over an 11 year cycle. And uh, there's been, if anything, a general decline in power output of the sun since the 1980s. So we can't explain the recent warming as a response to uh, changing power output of the sun. And uh, we certainly can't explain it as a response to volcanoes because those cause those sharp cooling dips in global temperature that you see there in the blue line. Those are associated with well, you know, well-known volcanoes that occurred starting from the left. There's Krakatoa there, then there's a series of small volcanoes in the early 1900s. Um, we have Agung in uh, Indonesia in the 1960s, El Chichon uh, in the early 1980s, and then Mount Pinatubo in 1990. We haven't had any major volcanoes recently, but of course uh, we could always have another one. Um, and uh, those cause a temporary uh, downturn in global temperatures, which can be quite substantial. Um, but the background warming trend that is shown here in orange is entirely driven by the combination of greenhouse gases and aerosols uh, increasing loading on the planet. Um, there's been a lot of questions over the past year, you know, what's been the impact of uh, COVID-19 on global warming? And the answer is not very much. Uh, we saw a small decrease in carbon dioxide emissions, a much bigger decrease in the short term in uh, aerosol pollution. So um, I'm sure you, you were all noticing that in, in Delhi and Mumbai. Um, but if anything, that reduction in aerosol pollution probably had a small warming impact on the planet because it takes away the uh, sun shielding effect of the aerosols. Um, either way, the, the impact of the temporary change in emissions resulting from COVID-19 uh, on global temperatures is uh, entirely insignificant. And what of course is important is how governments decide to invest 
in their recovery plans from COVID-19. And if we invest in more fossil fuel infrastructure, um, then we lock ourselves into more emissions in the future. And that, of course, is bad news for long-term warming. Um, in contrast, we do have an opportunity here, of course, um, to invest in greener alternatives. And that's something that a lot of people are talking about quite heavily at the moment. So let's just uh, think about how these things contribute to that ongoing warming. So the, the orange line here on this figure is the human-induced warming uh, with a range of uncertainty on it indicated by the orange plume. And if we zoom in now on what's driving that orange line, it's basically two things. The dark gray region here is the cumulative impact of carbon dioxide emissions. So the vast bulk of the warming to date is due to carbon dioxide emissions just adding up over time. Every ton of carbon dioxide that we dump in the atmosphere drives up global temperatures. And so if we just add up carbon dioxide emissions over time, we get the carbon dioxide contribution to warming, which is why, of course, um, carbon neutrality is so important for stopping global warming. We won't stop this gray wedge from getting ever thicker until we stop dumping carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. And the light gray wedge is the net impact of other climate drivers. That's methane, ozone changes, nitrous oxide, and those aerosols uh, that I mentioned earlier. So you can see they're adding perhaps 20% to the carbon dioxide induced warming, um, and we need to get those under control as well. But the main story here is carbon dioxide. And so that's why in the 1.5 degrees report in late 2018, we concluded um, two things here, reaching and sustaining net zero carbon anthropogenic carbon dioxide emissions. And, and this is where it gets a little jargon heavy, apologies for this, um, declining net non-CO2 radiative forcing would halt anthropogenic warming on multi-decadal timescales. This is one of those um, negotiated sentences in the summary of the IPCC 1.5 degrees report. You can always spot negotiated sentences because they have sort of slightly peculiar words in them like halt. Um, the reason it's halt is because um, some governments were unhappy with us saying would stop global warming. You, you might use that because it technically, I think it's fair enough, it wouldn't stop global warming forever, um, but it would, it would halt global warming, uh, certainly for a few decades, century time scale. What happens in the very long time scale is still unclear because we've already warmed up the climate system that may result in some residual emissions that we would actually need to get negative carbon dioxide emissions to keep temperatures stable. But, you know, I'm going to be focusing really on what it takes to halt global warming in this sense. I, I'm not going to be talking about the, the very long-term multi-century outlook, where it might be necessary to go beyond um, achieving net zero um, carbon dioxide emissions and declining net non-CO2 radiative forcing in order to keep global temperatures stable on very, very long timescales. So just to reiterate what this jargon means, net non-CO2 radiative forcing means the warming impact in terms of the balance of energy coming into the planet from the sun and going back out into planet, uh, go back out into space um, due to other climate drivers like aerosols, methane and nitrous oxide, um, other than carbon dioxide. So this uh, figure here shows the, uh, you know, how we summed up those conclusions. Um, and importantly, it shows how we've already reached um, past one degree of global warming, as I was showing you on that previous um, slide and warming, if we just carry on at the current rate at uh, more than two tenths of a degree per decade, reaching 1.5 degrees around 2040, um, with of course some uncertainty on that, which means that we have to work hard to reduce carbon dioxide emissions rapidly um, and um, control these other drivers of climate change in order to limit warming because the peak temperatures we reach, this is the, the next um, conclusion reached by the 1.5 degrees report, the maximum temperature reached is determined by cumulative net global anthropogenic carbon dioxide emissions, apologies for the number of 
uh, qualifiers there, but basically that just means the total amount of carbon dioxide we dump in the atmosphere over all time, uh, not just last year, um, and the level of non-CO2 radiative forcing. So, you know, what's happening? So what matters is the total amount of carbon dioxide we dump in the atmosphere and what we do with these other drivers um, in the decades immediately prior to the time maximum temperatures are reached. And just to get a more intuitive feel for this, um, we can go to this uh, website here, uh, which uh, I encourage you to, to go to and show, your, show to your students and so on. And it allows you to play around with the main drivers of maximum warming. So assuming here, so you'll notice this, you'll recognize, I hope, this figure from, from the, the previous figure, um, which shows you know, anthrop uh, observed warming uh, in black, human-induced warming in orange, um, coming past one degree in 2018. It's now getting on well past 1.1 degrees. Um, and if you, if you vary, so this is a, a stylized scenario, which assumes we start reducing emissions right away. And the total amount of carbon we dump in the atmosphere depends on how fast we get carbon dioxide emissions to zero. If we get them to zero like instantly, which would be impossible, we'd have to stop the world economy overnight, you can see that that means that the total amount we dump in the atmosphere doesn't go much above what it already is today. So that's, that's this option. And that would, if we also act on uh, non-CO2 um, drivers as well, that would have a pretty good ch chance of keeping global temperatures below 1.5 degrees. You can see that that line is 1.5 degrees there. And you can see the range of uncertainty there is pretty much all below 1.5 degrees. So, so if we stopped emissions immediately, we probably wouldn't cross 1.5 degrees. Um, that's important actually, because a lot of people think, um, in fact, prior to the 1.5 degrees report, a lot of people were asking us, well, what's the point of a 1.5 degrees report? Because surely we're already committed to 1.5 degrees from past emissions. But that's not true. If we act, uh, if we were to stop emitting, we would see relatively little additional warming. You can see these, these lines are pretty horizontal going forwards. Um, and that's, you know, provided we uh, get other drivers under control and we stop emitting carbon dioxide, we wouldn't see much more warming. That's, of course, an important conclusion. It means that future warming is determined by future emissions. We, we have a choice here. It's not, we are not condemned to further warming as a result of emissions that have already taken place. But of course, it takes time to reduce emissions. You know, that, you know, an instant switch off of carbon dioxide emissions is, is not in any way realistic. Um, you know, it, it's a matter of policy debate as to what is realistic, what is feasible politically and so on. Um, if we were to reduce emissions to net zero globally um, in the 2050s and get other climate drivers under control, then we would see a sort of most likely warming around 1.5 degrees with a range of uncertainty going, you know, still below two degrees um, and at the lower end, not much higher than where we are at the moment, um, around that, around that uh, uh, warming. Um, if we, um, don't if we don't reduce carbon dioxide emissions as fast, leave it to 2100 um, before we uh, get to uh, net zero carbon dioxide emissions. And if we fail to act on other drivers of climate change so that we don't reduce them after 2030, or indeed if we even allow them to continue to rise, then you see it's pretty much inevitable that we will cross 1.5 degrees. And in fact, most likely we will end up over two degrees. So we, we need to limit both carbon dioxide emissions, uh, to, we need to get carbon dioxide emissions down to net zero, and we need to get other drivers of climate change under control in order to limit future, in order to, to achieve the goals of the Paris Climate Agreement. Okay, so that's, uh, that's a nice little demo, um, but um, let's go back to the PowerPoint now, if I can. Um, and uh, just to confirm, Nagraj, I'm back with my PowerPoint now, am I? Yes. Good. Yes. Excellent. Okay. So, um, so what does it what does it mean? What's it going to take to hold the increase in global average temperature to well below two degrees above pre-industrial, and pursue efforts to limit the temperature increase to 1.5 degrees? 
Well, one very simple way of thinking about it is uh, what I like to call the climate breaking time. Um, just to remind you of your, um, you know, when you took your driving lessons. And it's, again, this is quite a good way of sort of con communicating this to students and so on, because everybody can kind of remember learning this stuff when they were learning to drive. Um, and if you've got, if you're approaching a junction and it's 1.5 seconds before you reach the junction. Um, uh, was that a question or? And, okay, no problem. Um, well, not muted. Not no muted problem. Anything. Everybody else to kindly mute their uh, computers. Thank you. Um, but I must say, uh, just, to, just to stress, having given a lot of these talks, uh, there's nothing worse than losing the sound and then realizing that nobody can hear you. So please feel absolutely free to interrupt if, if, I, if you can't hear me or if the sound gets garbled. Uh, no, no, audio is not very good. It's not a problem. Please carry on. No problem. Good. Excellent. Okay. So, um, so, so sort of back to this analogy um, with the breaking time. Um, and again, I think this is quite an effective analogy to use for students. Um, you know, if it's one and a half seconds uh, before you reach the junction, then you've got three seconds to stop, but only if you start braking now. If you delay braking, of course, uh, you have much, much less time to stop. Um, if it's 15 years before you reach 1.5 degrees, and obviously I've chosen these numbers so that it's quite easy to do the maths in your head, then you've got 30 years to stop the warming if you want to keep temperatures to 1.5 degrees, but only if you start reducing emissions now. So it's exactly the same logic on current trends will reach 1.5 degrees um, in about 15 years, 15 to 20 years time. So we've got 30 to 40 years to stop the warming if we're going to meet the 1.5 degrees goal. Indeed, um, the picture may be um, even less, uh, it may be even more urgent than that if we want to keep temperatures below the 1.5 degree goal, um, given the latest revisions to global temperatures emerging from the UK Met Office. Um, by the way, you can find, uh, see more helpful maths problems like this. Again, um, you know, it's teachers against the climate crisis. So, so this is actually if you're if you're teaching um, at the um, sort of first year undergraduate or, or high school level, um, there's a lot of uh, helpful problems on mathsforplanetearth.org, which give you sort of um, interesting little maths exercises um, for um, uh, linked to. Uh, long-term sustainability questions. Um, so one question which actually is often asked is, you know, why 1.5 degrees? Um, wh why are we aiming for 1.5 degrees, um, given it's going to clearly take quite a major effort to achieve it? And one of the key reasons um, that I focus on is the inequities of climate change, the inequalities that are exacerbated by climate change, um, particularly at these relatively low levels of warming. You know, when we go to, you know, five or six degree type scenarios, um, you're talking about global systemic changes in the entire climate system, which will of course affect everybody. They will undoubtedly affect the world's poor and vulnerable more than they will affect um, those in rich countries, but they will, they, they will affect absolutely everybody when we get to that level of warming. But at these lower levels of warming, um, sort of 1.5 versus two degrees, that's where, uh, in my view, this is sort of a kind of a qualitative assessment, but I think it's, this is where, in my view, the inequalities between impacts in different regions are most obvious and most important. So this map here shows uh, countries of the world which are adversely affected economically, significantly reducing their economic growth over the coming century due to uh, half a degree of warming relative to today. And this is not a model result, based result here. It's based on an, an analysis of GDP statistics of these countries from World Bank data over the past 40 years. Now that of course is itself problematic because we're sort of assuming that um, the way economies behaved over the past 40 years um, is a guide to how they will behave in the future. It's a bit like those, whenever you see an advert for um, stocks, um, you know, there's always a sort of little qualifier in small print saying, you know, be careful, past performance is not necessarily a guide to the future. Well, um, so, so we are relying on past performance of economies and how they respond 
to temperature drivers in order to make this map, but at least it, it's real data going into this. It's not just sort of, um, it, it's not just a model uh, of, these, uh, of, of these economies. And what it tells us is that, um, you know, first of all, on the map, it's very clear where the effects, the economic effects of climate change are most likely to be felt first. And that's in countries in the tropics uh, around the, the equator and Southern hemisphere tropics um, that are first affected, countries like Indonesia, Nigeria, um, and uh, Angola is uh, sh uh, sh showing up there. And um, on, the, on the right hand panel here, it's the cumulative impact of those reductions in economic activity resulting from that warming added up over the century. We're seeing you know, a, a big range of uncertainty, which includes positive, um, but the possibility that it might be zero impact in, in, in the world as a whole, um, not in these individual countries, but there might. Um, but you know, on, on balance, we think the balance of evidence suggests we could see a reduction of sort of around 8% in GDP per capita by the end of the century, which is a substantial, substantial economic hit to the world as a whole and a much bigger economic hit to these individual countries. If we allow it to go to two degrees of warming, see a much more, uh, many, many more countries significantly affected um, in their uh, reductions in economic output. Aggregate global um, uh, losses go to greater than 10%, um, best estimate. Um, you can see India here is now uh, being significantly uh, adversely affected by the additional warming. A couple of countries emerge looking green, which means they have a uh, um, based on their performance over the past 40 years, they might expect uh, some benefits from this relatively low level of warming. Um, that's because these are countries in which um, cold costs money. Um, Canada is obviously one. Um, and uh, and that this, the warming may, be, may imply some benefit. But of course, in an interconnected world, I think it'd be very dangerous for a Canadian to take this, uh, take this uh, map and say, great, global warming is good. Um, because um, of course, this is based on variations that have occurred over the past 40 years. And as the world has become more interconnected, it is more likely that economic harms in India will be, in India, the countries like India and Brazil will be propagated through um, to um, economic harm in countries like Canada and Northern Europe. So this is where the economic impacts of climate change are most likely to be felt first at these lower levels of warming. And it's those inequalities that I think are really important in understanding why the countries of the world agreed to limit warming to 1.5 degrees. Um, and you know, I think it, I think it's uh, you know it was it, it's a very it's a very sensible goal because it limits the um, amount by which uh, climate change will damage economic growth in already vulnerable countries. So what it'll take, you know, coming back to this question of what it will take to stop the warming and what we mean by um, ca by carbon neutrality, climate neutrality, and so on. Um, I'm going to introduce you to an equation here, um, but uh, uh, I'll take you through it. Um, step by step. It's actually a pretty simple equation. Um, and it's an important one because it allows us to understand what causes future warming. Um, there's three terms in the equation. Um, it relates total human induced warming over an interval from a few years to a few decades to three things. Um, first of all, it's total cumulative carbon dioxide emissions, the total amount of carbon dioxide that we dump into the atmosphere over that time interval. So that's this E bar delta T. Um, so if the average carbon dioxide emissions multiplied by the length of the time gives you your total cumulative emissions. So I keep emphasizing we need to get cumulative, we need to limit cumulative carbon dioxide emissions. We need therefore to reduce um, the rate of emission um, of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere to zero in order to stop carbon dioxide from causing global warming. There's two other terms, and it's important to stress these are sort of in declining order of importance. That's the important one. If you don't remember anything else, remember that one. Um, this is the change in energy imbalance due to other drivers, things like methane and aerosols and so on. Um, and then this is the, so that's the change over this multi-decade period. And this is the long-term adjustment 
to past changes or to, if you've got a constant energy imbalance. And you need all three terms to understand fully what's going on, but basically this term really matters. This term matters at the sort of 20% level. This term matters at the sort of 2% level really. Um, so um, if, you, if, you want to, uh, if, if you sort of want to take away what's, what's important, um, sort of 80%, 18%, 2% might be a sort of good number to, numbers to have in your head. And it's that lot that need to reach net zero to stop global warming. And this is a really useful formula because it allows us to compare just by adding up emissions using that formula, it allows us to compare how on the left countries are contributing to the current warming rate, the rate at which we're driving up global temperatures, and on the right, how countries have contributed to warming over human history, over, well, over the past 250 years or so, since 1750. And you can see, first of all, there's a very good straight line relationship between the total um, stuff inside the brackets there and the modeled warming. So we've actually used a climate model here to work out these contributions. You can see there's a very good relationship between them. And it allows you to see, you know, what's driving current warming? Well, um, China's uh, pushing up global temperatures a lot um, by, you know, uh, almost uh, 0.8 uh, tenths of a degree. So um, 0.8 hundredths of a degree per decade is China's contribution. Um, the USA uh, and uh, the EU, the, the USA is, is not that far behind along with the rest of Asia. Um, and then India uh, is perhaps a fifth of China's contribution to the current warming rate. But that's a very different picture to how it looks if we look at contributions to warming since 1750 to date. And suddenly we see a lot of uh, resorting. Um, India is still around the middle of this uh, diagram, but now it's the USA and the European Union. Uh, that have actually contributed most to historical warming, of course, because we started dumping carbon dioxide into the atmosphere before anybody else did. China is pushed down into third spot here, um, and uh, uh, with followed by you know the likes of Russia um, and the rest of Asia and so on. So um, this this very simple formula allows you to assess what individual countries are doing to global temperatures, what they have done in the past, and indeed what they need to do in the future to get global warming back under control. So to stop global warming, we need to stop dumping carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. And we need to get other climate drivers like methane and aerosols and so on under control. But the first thing we need to do is to stop dumping carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. And this is important because there's only two ways to do it. Um, we could enact a global ban on the extraction and use of fossil fuels. And if that sounds implausible to you, um, we need to find an alternative, safe and permanent means of disposing of the carbon dioxide generated by fossil fuel use. Um, I find the idea of a global ban on fossil fuel use um, very implausible. Um, this is a, a picture, a very striking picture of a village in Greece where they discovered their village was built on lignite, a particularly high carbon form of brown coal. And as you can see, they literally dug the earth out from underneath the village, leaving only the church standing in order to get at the lignite coal. Um, so the idea that we will be able to sort of persuade people simply to move on from using fossil fuels, um, uh, I think is, is uh, optimistic in the extreme. Uh, I think we need to accept that we need to meet the Paris goals. We need to stop global warming before the world stops using fossil fuels. It'll be very hard to stop using fossil fuels entirely in time to stop global warming and meet the Paris goals. Um, this is important, of course, because a lot of people would like to talk about how we can move on from using fossil fuels rather than how we can stop fossil fuels themselves from causing global warming. Um, to, um, just to sort of illustrate this point, um, Cambridge came out with a report last year, um, absolute zero, 
basically talking about what it would take for Britain to stop using fossil fuels by 2050. And, you know, just to draw your attention to some of the sort of key points in this um, plan, you had to close all remaining airports. We had to uh, reduce all shipping to zero, only bring in food through the Channel Tunnel um, and completely phase out fossil fuels. That might be possible for a wealthy country like Britain, um, but, you know, you've only got to realize and imagine what that would involve um, to realize the how profoundly that would affect um, so many aspects of life in the UK. Um, and to recognize immediately that it's, it's you know, the idea of um, banning fossil fuels in a country like India over the next 30 years is frankly, if, to me at least, implausible. Um, so, which brings us to sort of the net in net zero and carbon neutrality. Um, can we compensate for continued fossil fuel use by planting trees? This is, of course, one of the most popular things people like to talk about at the moment. The World Economic Forum has a, a trillion trees campaign they're very excited about. Um, major oil and gas companies um, can talk about little else um, than so-called nature-based climate solutions or natural climate solutions, uh, where they're planting trees to mop up the carbon generated by our continued use of fossil fuels. Um, the difficulty with this uh, is, first of all, that storing carbon in trees is neither safe nor permanent. Um, in Brazil was up until 2019 a major recipient of carbon storage credits. Uh, lots of um, in entire countries like Norway paid Brazil to store their carbon uh, to compensate for the CO2 um, being emitted by those countries. And, you know, we had a change of government in Brazil. Um, we had a change of policy to uh, Amazonia. And a lot of that carbon went back into the atmosphere in the fires in Brazil in 2019. Um, secondly, so it's neither safe nor permanent, and it's limited. Um, if we actually look at, even with the most optimistic estimates, of what nature-based climate solutions could deliver by mid-century. So this is back to that diagram I was showing you earlier, but now with an ad additional, in the dashed line, additional carbon with carbon removal through nature-based climate solutions. And I stress this is the absolutely most optimistic imaginable um, estimates of what nature-based climate solutions could deliver. You can see we're seeing a change of about a 10th of a degree warming by mid-century under a 1.5 degree pathway, perhaps a couple of tenths of a degree, three tenths of a degree by the end of the century under a two degree pathway. So, you know, that's, that puts the, the contribution of nature-based climate solutions into context. You know, they might shave a tenth of a degree off a 1.5 degree pathway. They're not themselves going to solve the problem. And this is where I, I love this rule proposed by David Mackay um, and I couldn't recommend strongly enough his book, uh, Sustainable Energy Without the Hot Air. And one of his most famous uh, quotes was, don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to be pro-nuclear, I'm just pro-arithmetic. Um, and you know, I'm often quoted almost as if I'm anti-tree or pro-cow. Um, I, like David Mackay, I'm pro-arithmetic. I think it helps for us to think about these simple um, conceptual uh, equations that relate emissions to global temperatures. And we can use those equations to convince ourselves that action on methane, on global diet, for example, um, or action on planting trees, each might shave perhaps a tenth of a degree off global temperatures at the most optimistic level by 2050. Meanwhile, carbon dioxide emissions from fossil fuels and industry are driving up global temperatures by two tenths of a degree per decade. So we need to stop fossil fuels from causing global warming. And this diagram shows you a, the way in which we will have to do that, short of an outright ban. And what this shows you is that in the scenarios in which we meet the Paris temperature goals and reduce global warming to 1.5 degrees, we indeed get net carbon dioxide emissions into the atmosphere, which is the blue uh, area here in the left-hand panel, those emissions to the atmosphere indeed get to zero before 2060, but the total amount of carbon dioxide we produce from burning fossil fuels 
and making cement and so forth doesn't go down to zero at all. It goes down by about two thirds or so. And the gray wedge here is the carbon dioxide that is re-injected back into the Earth's crust that is permanently sequestered geologically back into the Earth's crust in these scenarios. And this is important because this is the only way to stop fossil fuels from causing global warming in the long term is, is to re-inject the carbon dioxide they generate back into the Earth's crust. And this has been going on for decades um, in uh, the Sleipner gas field, for example, in Norway, they've been re-injecting CO2 into um, subsurface aquifer uh, formations. Um, and you know, once you inject it, it stays there. It's, it, it, there's, there's plenty of fossil CO2 in the Earth's crust already. Um, and they're, they're already building um, coal-fired power stations, which can capture the carbon dioxide and dispose of it back underground. But it's interestingly, you know, this is not a popular technology um, at all among the, as it were, climate establishment. Um, people would much rather talk about other things. Um, and so I just like to sum up then with some facts to remember in the conversation about climate change solutions going forward. Climate change is fixable. Um, it's, uh, it was very striking uh, not long after the publication of the 1.5 degrees report, I was giving a talk about the report to a meeting of young engineers from one of the world's major fossil fuel companies. And of course, at the end of the talk, I got the inevitable question, um, do you personally think there's any chance of us limiting warming to 1.5 degrees? And I turned the question around and asked the room, well, if you had to decarbonize your product that is safely and permanently dispose of one ton of CO2 for every ton generated by the oil and gas you sell, would you be able to do it? And somebody asked, well, would the same rules apply to everybody? I said, okay, fine, maybe they would. At which point, all the young engineers just said, well, of course we could, you know, like it's even a question. Um, so it's absolutely possible to stop fossil fuels from causing global warming. But unfortunately, we tend to be talking about other things. We can't ban fossil fuels. We need to decarbonize them. We need to achieve net zero fossil fuels, which means safe and permanent carbon dioxide disposal. Developed countries, and indeed the sort of the climate establishment in general, would like to talk about almost anything else than CO2 disposal, because CO2 disposal is expensive. So they'd like to talk about promoting renewable energy or changing diet or planting trees or taxing and trading emissions. But in the end, none of these things will stop fossil fuels from causing global warming. And I think it's really important that countries that have a lot of fossil fuels to burn, like India, whether it's your own fossil fuels or other countries, um, join this conversation and talk about how we're going to stop fossil fuels causing global warming. Because I cannot imagine the world actually agreeing on a ban on fossil fuel extraction and use. And so the only other alternative is for those of, those of us who've actually benefited the most from the use of fossil fuels at the moment to, to uh, up, up, until, up until now, um, to make the investment to neutralize their climate impact in the future so that you know, countries like India can, if they so choose to do so, make their continued use of fossil fuels carbon neutral by, uh, but, you know, short, hopefully shortly after the middle of this century, so as to stop global warming in time to meet the Paris temperature goals. On that, uh, on that note, I'd, I'd like to um, stop for questions. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Professor Allen. Such a wide-ranging presentation. I'll now sort of open it out for questions, comments, and thoughts from anyone participating. Uh, you're encouraged to key in your questions and thoughts in the chat box and I'll ask it, Professor Aaron. In case you wish to ask him the question yourself, feel free to do so, but just sort of mention it there if possible, right? Yeah, and before we sort of get going, Professor Aaron, I had sort of one brief observation myself. You, there's a key point you made also about in the um, 2018 1.5C report about the committed warming, you say you mentioned today also being sort of, uh, sort of less than 0 0.5 degrees C. Uh, so does that committed warming also include slow feedbacks in the earth climate system? 
Um, on on century time scales, yes. This is what this comes back to this careful use of the word halt. Um, so um, in in terms of you know, so if we were to stop emissions tomorrow. Um, then over the rest of this century, we probably wouldn't see very much more warming. I, I should stress we can't do this. This is not a real scenario, but it's just it shows that uh, future warming for the rest of the century is determined by future emissions. Um, in the longer term, you know, over the 22nd century, would we still see some warming with um, net zero emissions? Uh, perhaps, because, of course, we have destabilized the system already. We're seeing a release of carbon from the Arctic, for example. Um, which might continue to accumulate in the climate system. So it might in the longer term be necessary to actually maintain a low level of negative carbon dioxide emissions. So actively taking carbon dioxide back out of the atmosphere in order to keep global temperatures even at their current level or even at a level of 1.5 or two degrees if that's where we manage to stabilize it. Um, but, but yeah, no, in, in the short term, I mean, in, in a sense it's, um, well, it's, it, it's a model. It's a re, it's a model result. Um, so so you should be careful, um, you know, it, not to be too encouraged, so to speak, because of course it is possible that there may be some um, feedback that we've already destabilized that we don't know about and is not represented in any of our models. Um, but certainly, uh, for the feedbacks that we have been able to represent in our models, we are um, you know we, we are seeing this uh, this effect that if we manage to stop emissions, we stop the warming. Great, thank you. Uh, so we'll sort of take the questions in the chat box. I'm going to also sort of jump questions if I need to. So I'm actually going to start with Professor Raghu Murthagunde before taking questions uh, that were sort of placed earlier in the chat box. So Raghu, why don't you come in with your question? You want to ask the, uh, Professor Allen the question you asked about the challenge of implementing solutions and how do we produce projections of those scales? Would you like to ask him yourself? Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, just Miles, thanks a lot. Great talk. Um, I don't want to rail about models, but I think uh, all of the ideas you, uh, I, first of all, I love that you say climate change is solvable. So I'm nervous about even descriptors like crisis, which I'm not sure lead to action necessarily. But in terms of implementation of all those things, including natural solutions, uh, we will need uh, information at kind of local scales maybe even watershed levels or bioregions, however you want to think. So what is the thinking in the UK in terms of, are you producing regional uh, scenarios to uh, uh, take actions? And how do you think uh, IPCC will play a role in the future in terms of providing regional information for actually doing these, uh, let's say just natural solutions? Well, I mean, the first thing I think we have to remember is sort of David Mackay's rule um, is to keep everything in perspective um, and you know remember the math the basic maths is that you know natural solutions can only help us so far and I think the the amount at which the amount of conversation about um, climate solutions seems to be almost in opposite inversely proportional to how useful they are so you know people will talk forever about um, climate solutions that really don't make very much difference, and then and then not talk about the big ones um, like how we stop using fossil, you know, how we stop fossil fuels from causing global warming. So um, the the you know a big conversation that needs to be had um, is to what extent net zero is going to be a net zero world is going to depend on transferring carbon from one part of the world to the other. I mean, it is possible, of course to have a global net zero in which carbon is being generated in one country and being mopped up in another country. I mean, CO2 is CO2, so that is, that is uh, uh, But a quick, I possible. just want to make, I mean, but, but, it, I, but it's, it's not sustainable, that's the problem. And so that's why I think we do need the sort of conversation you're alluding to about, you know, um, making, uh, get, getting the conversation going about how do we get to net zero regionally um, and, and, and the UK, for example, in our plans for net zero, when the, when the Climate Change Committee uh, talks about net zero, it talks about getting the UK itself to net zero within our boundaries, um, not um, exporting um, the task of mopping up our residual emissions to other people. Okay, I don't want to take too much time, but I think even solar and wind, which are needed desperately for 
replacing fossil fuels are very regional problems. So I was also thinking even those will need some sort of a planning, intermittency issues, uh, et cetera. So that information is also, for example, if uh, Tamil Nadu invests a billion dollars in offshore farms, and then in 10 years, there is no wind, then we are finished, right? So we need oh, some sure. reliability there, yeah. Sure, but 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 I think okay. So so I mean, it, it is important actually to, to 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 use. I mean, one of the sort of key uses of of high resolution modeling we, we, is 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 predicting um, uh, a future renewable energy resources. Um, but but I think um, there the outlook is pretty good. I think the 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 prospects of of climate change changing renewable energy resources significantly um, is uh, over the next few decades is is, is pretty low. Um, so I think, you know, that's a pretty, you know, the, the resource there for renewable energy is probably more um, reliable than the fossil fuel resource in many ways, um, because, um, you know, fossil fuel supplies can be impacted by all sorts of very unpredictable things like wars and so on. At least the sun will continue to shine that we can be fairly confident about. I'm seeing lots of very interesting questions in the chat. Do you want to sort of decide where I should go next, Nagraj? Yeah, I think we'll probably go roughly in the order in which they have been placed in the chat box. So there's a series of questions by uh, Rupchan Maknotra and sort of broadly, um, so there's this framing of sort of developed and developing countries in uh, both sort of climate politics and negotiations and so on. And so he has this question sort of right at the outset. He's got a number of questions, but I'm going to kind of try to crystallize them. He talks about the fact that the pressure on the planet is due to developed countries instead of justify warming, et cetera. Uh, uh, so um, money can create a one-time natural resource, et cetera. Why do you oppose the disastrous corporate capital system? I think his question is trying to uh, sense go to what Mighty understands as the roots of the problem, which is the sort of logic of the economic system. Uh, well, yeah, yeah, no, I think it's 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 a it's a it's a very fair question, um, and you know clearly the root of the problem is um, the sort of explosive economic growth we've seen over the past um, uh, couple of centuries um, or few decades um, in 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 the developing world. Um, but um, the, the 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 root of it um, is. Um, you know, it, again, you, you need to be a little bit careful about causality here. Um, is it capitalism itself, or is it the fact that we have allowed um, one of the mainstays of modern capitalism, um, fossil fuel use, um, to use the atmosphere as a giant landfill um, and, you know, get rid of its waste by dumping it in the atmosphere rather than disposing of it safely uh, without causing harm to the climate. And um, the danger, I fear, of um, focusing on systemic, you know, change to the entire economy as the way in which we will address climate change is I, I'm not, first of all, that makes it highly political. And of course, it makes, makes it then very difficult to, to convince large parts of the political spectrum to come along uh, with the solutions, um, but also potentially would, would take too long. I, I would argue we don't really have time to um, overthrow capitalism before we solve climate change. So we have to work out how we can solve climate change uh, within the framework of the capitalist system we are working in. And the fact that the fossil fuel industry remains, you know, it's 10% it's of the world economy measured by turnover, certainly not by market capitalization, but, but you know, this is still, you know, 85% of the world's primary energy still comes from fossil fuels. This industry is in a position to solve the problem. Um, but we, they, they, they've no, they've clearly not a, no great interest in doing so. Um, if um, those, if if they're simply being opposed by environmentalists who are calling for them to be shut down entirely, what I feel we should be doing is calling for the industry to fix the problem caused by the product it sells. So dispose of the CO two safely, don't dump it in the atmosphere, um, and and that's um, that 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 you know I I firmly believe would be a much more productive way forward um, than by uh, attempting to shut them down entirely. Of course, the consequence of requiring the fossil fuel industry to dispose safely of the CO2 it generates is it'll make fossil fuels very substantially more expensive. And that's you know um, fair enough. It means we'll probably use much less of them. 
we'll probably use much less fossil fuels over the next few decades anyway. Um, but I, I wouldn't want to let the industry off the hook by simply calling for them to be shut down uh, rather than calling for them to fix the problem that their product has created. It's a quite a good opportunity. Can I, if, I, if you don't mind, Nagraj, I noticed um, uh, we got uh, questions from Sagar Dara um, about the sort of viability of CCS um, and the risks of leakage and so on. Yeah. So it might be a good one to, good point to pick that up because it connects to this um, same sure. question. Um, I, I, I agree that we, we have to find ways of getting rid of CO2 and not all of the ones we try will be effective. Um, but that doesn't mean that we, it doesn't make it optional to get rid of the CO2. We, we have to get rid of CO2 safely. We cannot dump it into the atmosphere. If a company starts injecting CO2 and discovers um, that it's triggering seismic activity, then they, should, they need to find another way of disposing of the CO2. They can't just go back to dumping it into the atmosphere. So, you know, I think that's, that's where, why we need to be forcing the industry to prove it can get rid of its CO2 or to develop ways of get rid of it, get, getting rid of its CO2 safely today, because only that way will we discover what their capabilities are. And it may well be that it will prove very expensive to get rid of CO2 on the kind of scale that we need them to do so. In which case their products will become very expensive and we'll use very little of them and we'll have a much smaller fossil fuel industry. That's fine. I, don't, I won't weep for the fossil fuel industry if it ends up shrinking. But I, what I don't want to happen is for the fossil fuel industry to carry on with business as usual for the next 20 or 30 years. And then for taxpayers in the 2040s to have to get rid of vast amounts of CO2 um, in, you know, because we, we haven't actually required the industry to do it itself. Um, that's the sort of worst possible outcome because those taxpayers are going to have to be paying for a lot of things, including adapting to climate change at the time. So that's why I argue that we need to focus on requiring the industry to get rid of CO2, to get rid of its CO2 now. Right. Uh, so Dwaipayan strategy has a question regarding where one would sort of place sort of responsibility um, for climate change. It's, it's a sort of ask question, suppose you have a demand for electricity, and you have the choice to buy it from a company which provides it cheaply, who is responsible for the rise in, air, in emissions? Is it the party that demands, that is me, or the provider, uh, the, the company that's selling it cheaply, or the fundamental idea itself of buying it cheap? Uh, this question also might sort of broadly link, I suppose, to the question of emissions from importing and exporting countries. I and mean, where would I sort of place sort of responsibility? I mean, would you place it in China, as you mentioned earlier? So basically, exporting their goods to Europe and the US, uh, and I wouldn't look at sort of imposed made emissions, if I could sort of link it to that, please. Yeah, so I think, uh, to my mind, the simplest um, point to assign responsibility um, is actually where the fossil fuels come out of the ground. I mean, once you've dug up fossil fuels, um, and um, you're, you are planning for the carbon content of those fossil fuels to get dumped into the atmosphere. Um, and, um, and interestingly, by the way, this is not where the fossil, this is not where most people think about the responsibility at all. Um, most people think about it either at the point of use of the goods or the point of emission of the CO2. Um, but actually, I think at the moment, the, the primary responsibility should be considered when fossil fuels come out of the ground. Um, and because that is the point at which um, the real profits are made, because it is still very cheap to dig up fossil fuels compared to what it's worth to burn them and generate energy. So that's where I think we need to be focusing on the, the whole responsibility question. And, and I think the arguments um, about sort of who's responsible downstream, I think are a much, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're the, there's arguments either way. I don't think those arguments are ever going to end because I can sort of see that, see how the how those arguments could continue forever. Um, but there's, to my mind, there's no question if you're if you're if you're making money by selling a product that's causing a particular environmental harm that has to cause a particular environmental harm in the way it's used, then you have a responsibility for addressing that environmental harm. Lavanya has a question, Professor Allen. Lavanya asks, about, I request you to expand on your experience as an IPCC author with negotiating sentences and words 
before they appear in IPCC reports? Um, the, I mean, the IPCC process, and many, many of you actually um, uh, may have actually had some direct experience of it. Um, it is, it is a, it's a fascinating process, and it's one which, I, you know, I've, I've grown to respect um, a lot um, over the years, um, in particular because governments uh, take, it, take it extremely seriously, and um, they, um, they, 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 they need to make sure that the language, particularly the language in the you know, heavily quoted summaries for policymakers of these IPCC reports, reflects the content of the underlying report and the underlying literature. Um, so, you know, the, the, while these summaries initially are drafted by the scientists um, and, and, and all the, 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 throughout the actual um, creation of the sentences um, that we, we that we produce in these reports uh, come from from the scientists um, so um, but what what happens is that in these uh, final plenary meetings where people always end up spending you know working all night and, and negotiating uh, uh, individual words in sentences and so on um, the the what, what happens is, is countries sort of look at the proposed text and ask you know is it is it actually you know, could it be misunderstood? Could it could it could the wrong could the wrong conclusions be drawn from this the way this has been worded, or is it not supported by the literature? Um, and and we and they they go through it very carefully um, to to make sure that um, uh, the 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 language is is well understood. And and this is you know it it's a it's a very effective process because um, it was introduced back in the late nineteen eighties. Because I think countries realized there was no way they were going to be able to negotiate something as complicated as a global climate treaty if they were always arguing over the science. So they introduced the IPCC to provide, as it were, a level science playing field so that everybody agreed sort of what the basic scientific facts were they were going to work from, and then they, they could negotiate policy on top of that. And a very good example of the, of the system working very well was you know, the net zero result in the first place. In the, it wasn't until 2009 that a whole lot of papers appeared within a few months of each other, making the point that we had to get global carbon dioxide emissions to net zero to stop global warming. And before then, you know, the whole focus of climate policy was on stabilizing concentrations of greenhouse gases, on the idea of contraction and convergence to some long-term per capita rate of emission. And this idea that we had to get emissions of you know, the main CR, greenhouse pollutant carbon dioxide to, to, to zero was, was pretty radical, pretty novel for a lot of people in the negotiation process. But you know, because it went through the IPCC assessment process, everybody had a chance to comment and understand it and you know, make sure that it was agreed what it meant. Um, it was you know, put into practice in the Paris Agreement only six years later, which I think is, you know, if, you, if, you, if you step back and think about that in terms of new science being incorporated into an international agreement, I think that was remarkable. So the process does work, although it can, it can mean a lot of late nights. Next question is from Rajeshwari, Rajeshwari Raina. Uh, and Rajeshwari, please come in if I'm not able to convey your question clearly. So she's concerned about your statement that countries like the United Kingdom would get along without much trade or imports, while countries like India would find it difficult without trade. And she asks, how does London's, uh, just one city's ecological dependence on the rest of the world, uh, she's put in brackets 6.63 giga hectares of land per person, uh, how would sort of that work out? And this maths is not just about food or beverage imports. Uh, is that yeah. Yeah, okay. So, so I, I hope I didn't say I didn't I I, I didn't um, I didn't mean to say that. Um, I was I think when the the statement you're referring to um, was when I was discussing the Cambridge Absolute Zero uh, report, and um, I, I said it would be possible, just possible, but highly debatable, whether the UK could actually achieve absolute zero in terms of um, no longer uh, depending on uh, sort of imported carbon or export of CO2 uh, and to the rest of the world. Um, 
I, I personally think it could not. I think it, I think it would be. Uh, I find the absolute zero vision um, highly implausible. Um, so even though we could possibly cope uh, by getting our emissions uh, to zero, you know, th entirely through our own efforts, um, and uh, uh, and by you know ending all air trans uh, ending all air transport and and shipping and so forth. Um, I think it, it, it would not be a path that the rest of the world could follow. So I actually think, and this is a really important point, I think a lot of the focus in um, the environmental movement in developed countries is on, you know, our responsibilities, which is quite correct. You know, we, we have a, a, a high responsibility for this problem because we've contributed most to it in the past. Um, but, the, but one of the unhelpful conclusions from focusing on this responsibility question is that we have to focus on ways of getting our emissions down as fast as possible ourselves, um, which may mean that we're not getting them down in ways that would be most useful to the rest of the world. So for you know Britain, for example, we could get our own emissions to, to zero um, with um, a reliance entirely, it's been argued, on energy storage, um, uh, offshore wind, and solar. Um, but that's not a model in, we, that happens to be possible for the UK because we have very good offshore wind capabilities. And if we can crack the energy storage problem, then um, we should be able to, um, to basically make ourselves uh, uh, CO2 neutral just on that basis alone. Um, but um, it's not, big, you know, how does that help the rest of the world? Um, in particular, it doesn't help the rest of the world with the problem of how do we get rid of the CO2 generated by fossil fuel uh, ongoing use of fossil fuels. So I think, for example, the UK has, which also has um, unique um, resources for getting rid of CO2, we've got a responsibility to show the world how that can be done. Thank you. Uh, Anish Wanayak has a question uh, about the climate establishment. He asks, he's curious about who you mean when you use the term climate establishment. Do you mean the negotiations, the government, I mean, developed countries, or do you mean activists in the global north and global south? And linked to that, what do you make of Joe Biden's current platform, which seems to rely on carbon capture and storage, plus allowing greater extraction through fracking, etc.? So, so I, I was the, the climate establishment. It's, it's a sort of slightly um, uh, playful term. Of course, it's not. It's not. Um, it's 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 just my view. Um, but when I've been to IPCC meetings or to um, uh, to UNFCCC meetings, uh, the conversations seem to be quite heavily dominated still by voices from. Um, European um, governments and uh, European NGOs um, who have a particular view of the world, and um, and th this is th th this is what I sort of seem to see as the climate establishment at the moment. Um, and you know, very often it's sort of casting India as the as the as the bad the bad guy, so to speak, as as being too slow in the in these. Uh, in these people's views um, to reduce emissions, and um, and uh, uh, you know, I, I find that worrying because it's it's a very um, it's a very specific worldview um, that that establishment uh, represents. Um, so, but you know, most of the um, big names I'm not going to list names actually, but most of the sort of big names you see. Um, talking about climate change or pronouncing on climate change in the build-up to um, these global international um, uh, uh, meetings would, would, would tend to come from a, a, a similar worldview about what's um, sort of meant to happen. Um, and uh, I worry that there's perhaps not enough discussion about different perspectives bringing in different worldviews um, on this. And it's sort of one, it's one rather sort of elite view of the world um, imposing its ideas on everybody else. That's, that's my concern. And well-intended, well-intended ideas. I'm not suggesting there's any you know, evil conspiracy here, um, but there is a tendency 
um, for a sort of self-reinforcing view of the world, uh, which we should be conscious of. Um, particularly us as climate scientists, um, you know, it's much easier for us to talk to environmentalists than it is for us to talk to, um, well, put it this way, I, I, in the past 10 years, I've given, um, I, can't, I don't know how many talks to environmental groups. I've given one talk to a coal mining company. And yet there are probably more people in the world who work for coal mining companies than who belong to environmental groups. I don't know, maybe that, I just made that statistic up. I'm not sure if that's true, but you know, so, so it, just as a climate scientist, inevitably I'm talking a little bit within a bubble of opinion um, that um, we should be careful about a sort of self-reinforcing worldview developing from that. That's what I mean by the climate establishment. Yeah. On the question of the Biden platform, I strongly welcome um, the emphasis in the US on CCS because that's pioneering the process of safe, permanent disposal of carbon dioxide. I think we're going to learn a lot from that. Um, it's interesting that they're almost apologizing for it. They're almost saying, you know, uh, they're, they're kind of almost embarrassed about it. Um, whereas what they could be doing is getting on the front foot and saying, no, we're the ones who are showing the world how to stop fossil fuels from causing global warming, because that's what it does. You know, developing renewable energy increases the amount of energy available, but it doesn't stop fossil fuels from causing global warming because there are still uses of fossil fuels that will continue even with abundant renewable energy supplies. So we've got to you know, step back and ask, how do we stop fossil fuels themselves from causing global warming? And the only way to do that is to find safe and permanent ways of getting rid of the CO2 they generate, which is something the US investment in CCS will help deliver. So if I understood one of your slides, Professor Allen, you said that the geological CO2 storage is the only way to go about it. So is cost a constraint? I mean, the reason why it hasn't actually expanded so far. It's the only way, if you're going to burn fossil fuels, it's the only way to stop them causing global warming. Okay, so that's the, that's the uh, so that doesn't mean it's the only thing you can do about climate change. Of course, there's all these other things we can do, which helps us reduce our dependence on fossil fuels, makes it easier to stop them causing global warming. But in the end, you're going to have to work out ways of getting rid of that CO2. It's the only way available at the moment. There are other ideas out there, like remineralizing the CO2, turning it back into rock and so on. But these are sort of kind of lab scale um, activities at the moment. The only, the only scalable way of, of getting rid of CO2 is, is, uh, is by um, geological disposal. And, and of course, it's expensive. So that's, that's, that's kind of the point in that um, it, to, to get rid of the CO2 generated by fossil fuels would add a lot to the cost of fossil energy. And will make, of course, other ways of generating energy much more attractive. Um, but, you know, We've got no alternative. If we're going to carry on using fossil fuels, we're going to have to get rid of the CO2 they generate. That's just the way it is. So I would, you know, I would argue the sort of arguments which go on about the cost effectiveness of different mitigation options in many ways miss the point because there's only, there's only one way of stopping fossil fuels from causing global warming. It doesn't matter what it costs. That's the only, that's the only way available. And you know, while we can't require, and there's no need to require the industry to be disposing of 100% of the CO2 it generates today, it does need to be disposing of 100% of the CO2 it generates by the time we get to net zero, because that's what net zero means. So you know, we need to see from the industry, how are they gonna get that? There are a couple of follow-up questions that have come in to your responses. Raghu Murthugadde has a question. I'm not sure whether it's been answered, Raghu. If it hasn't, then please come in later. And Anish, too, has a question that's just come in. Let me just first go to um, Tafal Raburi. He's talking about questions around town transport and public transport. And he asks about sort of decarbonization. How is it possible at the micro level to say each, of each vehicle's emissions and so on? So how would one essentially um, yep. decarbonize? Questions from so, the, 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 the Professor Allen to respond to that. 
Sure, no, no that, that's that's helpful actually. Because that's a, so so this is why I was saying um, we need to impose the responsibility at the point the CO two comes out of the ground, as the point the carbon comes out of the ground. So if you're selling a fuel that the user is going to generate carbon dioxide from that from using that fuel, then you know if we're going to actually get to a sustainable net zero world, you need to you need to be required to get rid of that CO two before you sell the fuel at all. Um, so um, that means that for, for sort of aviation fuel, for example, of course, there's no way of capturing the CO2 that comes out the back of a jet engine. So anyone selling aviation fuel would have to get rid of the corresponding amount of carbon dioxide, uh, ultimately by recapturing it from the atmosphere and burying it back underground, which is a, you know, which is a, a, a difficult, um, uh, you know, it's a difficult and expensive thing to do, but it can be done. It's, it's, it's already being done. Uh, there are companies already that are offering to do that for a price. On the, can I just respond to um, a question about technocentric solutions? Um, I, 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 I think that's a good, it's a good, because it's a good question. I just spotted it in the chat. I, I'd like to, like to address it. Um, it's, it's, I'm, I guess what I'm, I, I'm a physicist, and I guess my motivation here is to, um, in Einstein's dictum, make everything as simple as possible, but not simpler. And we are doing a, we are, we are, we are involved in a technocentric activity in burning fossil fuels. So I would like the fossil fuel, th those involved in that activity to neutralize their impact on the environment. Um, Many other things have to change as well. Many things have to change about, our, uh, about the way we behave, the way we interact with the environment, the way we interact with each other, the way we interact with you know, um, the, the world economy as a whole. Lots of things have to change. But if we just sort of narrow it down, this one thing has to be fixed. Um, and if we say that we're going to solve climate change through changing people's behavior or through changing the economy or whatever, we are in effect giving those who are benefiting from this technocentric activity of burning fossil fuels, we're giving them a free pass because we're not asking them to fix the problem that their product is creating. So um, I would argue, you know, we should have technocentric solutions to technocentric problems and social solutions to social problems. So, but, 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 but requiring a social solution to a very high, very private technocentric problem, I think is unfair. I think it's unfair to expect the world's consumers to fix a problem that's being caused by a highly profitable industry. No, let the industry fix it. Yeah, and we are probably the response to that. It's a really Perspective. Uh, Anish, just one moment. Sa sorry, Sagar, do you want to come in? Sagar, do you want to come in? Briefly, yes. Yeah, you know, I think the solution is uh, typically uh, not centric. No. Sorry, Sagar, your no. audio is not great. Could you just. Yeah. Otherwise, you type a question in the chat box and we can. Problem. Then... Uh, and it really is going to leave. Is this better? Yeah. Hello. <clears throat> yeah, is this better? Hello. We can hear you now. Yeah, come in, Sagar, briefly. Can, can you hear me now? Yes, yes. Hello. Yeah. Uh, my understanding of uh, CCS technology is that it has just not worked properly today. I don't know on what basis uh, uh, is basically saying that CCS is the second point really is that anything which is technocentric is going to give an advantage uh, to the North countries and is going to leave the South countries behind. It's like the North countries create the problem, but the impacts are going to be really uh, large on the South countries. And uh, as long as you keep on transferring it, that go to 
you know, basically uh, uh, cause the carbon dioxide emissions, that they should fix it. Why just the corporates? Why not the countries? Why not the region? You know, solve the problem. Why doesn't Europe and America, in fact, reduce their consumption? Why, why do they want to maintain those uh, levels of consumption and then say, no, there are technical solutions for the whole thing? So I, th I think this links to the question that was asked by Makrotra at the beginning. But in case Professor Allen wants to come, I think he, I think he, in a way he already responded to this to the to the idea. But but please, if you wish to respond further, Professor Allen. But I I I, I do I you know I, I'm very much aware of um, the sort of north. I mean I, I hope it came, came across in the talk. I'm very much aware of the of the uh, the north south tensions here. Um, I guess the framing, first of all, I, I'm not suggesting um, that, um, as it were, CCS is the only solution to climate change. Lots of, I keep emphasizing, lots of things will change um, as we reduce our dependence on fossil fuels. Um, but what I am insisting is it's the only solution to continued fossil fuel use in a net zero world, because that's just true. You, you can't turn fossil fuels into trees. Um, it's just not sustainable. And so the only way to compensate for the impact of continued fossil fuel use in a net zero world is geological disposal of the CO2 it generates. Um, I don't see this as particularly a, well, I, I, I do see a north-south issue in saying, okay, we now need to get rid of the CO2 generated, you know, the, the we now need to move to a world in which we dispose safely of the CO2 generated by our fossil fuels when the North, um, you know, back in the last century when most of the emitting was being done by the North, we didn't bother to do this. So, so it's sort of we're making it much more difficult to use fossil fuels now that the global South is actually starting to use um, much more fossil fuels. And I do understand that there's, there's a great injustice developing there and it's something we need to address. Um, however, it seems to me that the current situation of the North focusing entirely on things like, um, you know, nature-based climate solutions um, or sort of behavior change and so forth um, means that we are leaving investment in geological disposal of CO2 to the South in the future. So we're sort of almost making it doubly worse because we're... we're investing only in the cheap things right now um, and not investing in the expensive solution that we know will be needed at some point this century and just leaving it um, to the global south to fix. So um, yes, I would agree with you that this proposal is, is you know, problematic from a justice perspective. I think any proposal is problematic from a justice perspective on this issue, but I would argue it's actually substantially less problematic than what we're doing at the moment. Um, Arvind Nagarajan has a question regarding uh, BCCS and the extent of carbon that can be stored. So he asks that even in a best case scenario, NCS can only shave one tenth of a temperature target. Uh, BCCS can apparently store anywhere between 0.1 to nine DTC a year. The EU proposal not only includes BCCS, but also bringing back a failed, failed trading mechanism akin to red. Um, and so uh, the EU and the developed world are not called out enough on the policy gamble of future office based on nature-based climate solutions. If I sort of got his question right, and not, uh, as he asks about extent of carbon that can be stored and how much sinks can be created and regarding BCCS. Hello, yeah, Naga. Question. Hello, hello, Naga. Just one moment, Ruchan. One moment, please. Yeah. Let, let me let me add my question in there so that Alan is able to answer the two question in one time. Sure. Okay. Uh, yeah. Briefly, yeah, please. Uh, my query is that all the world people have focused only on the consumption of the uh, petroleum or hydrocarbons. I am of this opinion that planet having a only some one time use natural sources, one time use natural sources like rare earth element or other elements or cementing a, a component of cements. If once used, cannot be recycled again. Uh, 
means simply a focusing of only hydrocarbons and delete uh, deleting the others at a random free use of the peoples it means we are creating a more pressure on the people and deceiving the whole world people on the only hydrocarbon agenda means one time use elements in the planets or share of the global people not of the particular ruling elite of the corporate capitalist system ruling the world so so i agree we need to be aiming for a circular economy um uh, uh, we need to be phasing out our, our dependence on one time use resources um and so so in the in the in the big picture i completely agree with you um my while we are aiming to do that this comes back to the question of you know should we just try and ban the fossil fuel industry or should we require it to fix its own problem um if we ban it slowly which is the current plan you can't ban it overnight because we depend on it so the if you ban it slowly over decades um then during those decades you allow it to continue to make private profits while requiring you know society to clean up its waste later that seems to me to be wrong so i would argue let's as we transition to a circular economy let's require the remaining non-circular actors in our economy at least to tidy up their own waste i mean that seems like a very simple um requirement um that if it was imposed on the fossil fuel industry would largely solve the climate problem if we were able to stop fossil fuels from causing global warming and the industry is absolutely capable of doing that it's just that nobody's even asking them to try then we would very substantially reduce the climate challenge we wouldn't eliminate it but we would very very substantially reduce the climate challenge we face so just a couple of more questions professor allen uh there's just one more follow up from anish with that i had just a brief question to ask actually mine is a earth system question uh, as we move towards net zero and given the ongoing energy transition uh, which might be flattening of coal a reduction in aerosols in particular Uh, what is your est estimation of sort of how the earth system might respond i'm referring in particular say to the rise in temperature that the ri rise in average temperatures we've seen in recent years possibly because of aerosols or even the kind of rainfall that you mentioned in your uttarakhand paper so maybe my question is what would be the sort of earth system responses in the trajectory towards net zero uh, you know i think it's a great it's a great question and i'm afraid the the brutal answer is i don't know because we don't you know we've never observed um the climate system on a a rapid declining emissions trajectory uh we're very reliant on our models uh, for this um and there's all sorts of indications that the the declining carbon dioxide emissions and presumably declining emissions of of other pollutants at the same time will have a very different impact on the world's weather to rising carbon dioxide emissions so you know this is this is one of our big you know attribution challenges if you like um is to understand the impact not just of um global warming to date but of the speed at which we're driving climate change um and how that contributes to uh, ongoing weather risks and that's actually work that uh, actually we've been working on with with Krishna Achutara and, and colleagues actually for 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 many years is understanding these things um in um you know in the most detailed uh, climate models we have available so i'm afraid it's it's not a very satisfactory answer to your question in that i i i i think i have to acknowledge that is something that the scientific community does not really know yet um but it doesn't you know but, but we do have the tools to address it okay thank you there's one last question from anish vanayak and i'll request anish to come in himself to ask you directly anish would you come in you had a follow up question um yeah actually uh i mean I guess we've been circling around this question a few different times, so I'd probably want to reword even what I've what I've written. Uh, the basic question was why the preference for a market-mediated uh, version of this, right? So basically, what you seem to be saying is get the fossil fuel companies to uh, to to do the CCS, don't put it on the taxpayer, and uh, and basically, if wherever that puts them in the market, if that prices them out of certain places. 
that's fine. If they get euthanized, that's great, and so on. Um, so basically, you're making the market the hinge of of whatever mechanism you're, uh, you're 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 proposing in a sense. And I'm I'm curious about why you you have a preference for this. Uh, for one, for instance, if you're prepared to countenance a euthanizing or an increase in the price of fossil fuels, uh, aren't we back to square one? For instance, developed countries might not be able to afford the levels of fossil fuels. It'll, it'll have the same outcomes in terms of, uh, you know, uh, whether we can use it, not use it, that you've already talked about, except that we've gone about it rather than the direct route, we've gone about it via let the market work it out. Uh, or the other end of that question, which I, I didn't ask, but I guess gets posed, is um, is your sanguinity about the fact that it's possible to do it, and the and the and the uh, and the, the the fossil fuel companies can do it. Uh, well, then the question arises: Why aren't they doing it? And uh, is that simply a question of if it was an easy fix that wasn't hitting their bottom lines, presumably since, you know, like they like saying we've planted so many trees, they would have done it already. So clearly it's hitting their bottom line in some major way. Uh, what's the plan for getting rid of these calculations? In a certain sense, what I'm asking is the same things that are going to be required to get rid of the fossil fuel industry is going to be required to even implement the market mediated version of things that you're you're talking about which is building up social power uh to oppose the fossil fuel companies and this is where joe biden is not the answer in a certain sense because he's trying to get the one without the other he's trying to say to the fossil fuel companies all is great we can get on board with you and so on uh but uh, but we just capture all the carbon and, 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 and get rid of it. And that's a version of the technocratic solution. I agree. I mean, we're going to need some of this technology, but that's a version of the technocratic solution, which relies on the market mediation. And for that reason, I'm not sure actually addresses what is not a technocratic problem, but is in fact a social problem, which is the social power of the fossil fuel companies. Um. So, so yes, I mean, uh, uh, first of all, look, I, I'm not, I, I, I couldn't possibly suggest, I, I wouldn't want to suggest that, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm entirely um, confident that this would work. Um, that said, I'm 100% confident that the alternative won't work. So, um, you know, at least it has some chances. Um, the, 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 the alternative being attempting to ban the fossil fuel um, industry entirely. Um, so, um, I think we 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 need to. In, uh, the, the reason I'm confident of that it remains um, in terms of turnover. If you look at the fossil fuel industry as a whole, including um, national, um, uh, you know, um, state fossil fuel companies, um, which, which actually dominate the the upstream uh, part of the industry, um, it, it's it's you know it's still ten percent of the world economy. It would not be possible. Um, in well, without a, a complete reworking of the way the economy, the global economy works, um, for the state to take over that level of activity, um, you know, I, so so um, you know, I think we we, and it, nor nor is it obvious to me that it would be desirable for the state to take it over when we are essentially asking this industry to do what we need this industry to do is what they're already proven quite good at, which is, you know, moving fluids and gases around, um, and, you know, and pumping them in and out of the ground. I mean, that, that's kind of what they do. So, um, uh, you know, it seems to me to be the more natural solution to require the industry to get on with it rather than um, uh, sort of do, doing it um, through, through the public purse. Um, but, um, you know, the, 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 the question of whether this would address the problem of um, the power of the industry, I think is, is a, you know, it is a profound one. And, you know, obviously what you would not want to do would be to go to this route, um, allow the industry to continue to set the rules, um, and then, you know, for it to dodge its responsibilities in, in the future. So the one thing, and this, you know, how on earth would you make the industry do this? Obviously, the industry won't do it on its own, because any single company 
that started to dispose of carbon dioxide on any scale would just instantly make itself less profitable, would make its own products more expensive and would you know, put itself out of existence. Its competitors would take it over. So it has to be done by governments requiring the industry as a whole to change its mode of practice. Um, but there are precedents for that. Uh, and in some ways, the industry might quite welcome that sort of regulation, provided the same rules apply to everybody. And this is, you know, whenever I've talked to people within the industry about this idea, the first thing is, would, first question is always, well, would the same rules apply to everybody? And, you know, of course, they would have to, um, so that you could, you know, otherwise you could have, you know, one fossil fuel company completely out competing the others because it would just be selling its fossil fuels without bothering to dispose of the CO2. Um, so, so, you know, but if we do apply the same rules to everybody, then this does provide a, a way forward um, against a, a, a way forward for actually developing this technology without it costing, without it representing a major draw on the public purse. And that I do feel strongly about. I don't think taxpayers should be subsidizing or, or paying to clean up after this still very profitable industry. They should get on with it themselves. They should be required to do so. Yeah, so I think Anisha had a sort of few follow-up comments, but I think Anisha, I think we could probably carry on uh, the discussion. I mean, the, the, the reason they're not lobbying for it is because the current situation suits them just fine. They're just selling their product and making loads of money um, and, you know, essentially every ton of carbon dioxide generated today is a ton that's quite likely going to have to be scrubbed out of the atmosphere again at some point this century. But of course, if, if, if they just sell their products and somebody else burns it, mm, who cares? It's somebody else's problem in 40 years time. So, so, you know, of course, the fossil fuel industry isn't lobbying for this right now. But, you know, uh, they need to be held to account. We need to, we need to start asking this question. Why, why aren't you getting rid of your CO2? Thank you, uh, Professor Allen. Thank you for a very insightful presentation and catalyzing what is obviously a very rich and animated discussion. Yeah, uh, thanks for the questions, everybody. And thank you all for joining in today. And once again, so draw attention to the paper uh, that of which Professor Allen is one of the co-authors. It pertains to the extreme event of Uttarakhand of June 2013. And it talks about the frequency with which such an event might recur under specific future scenarios of 1.5 degrees C and 2.C. It's a very uh, sobering paper, but it's one that's very enriching and very much worth reading. And it's also there's some very insightful comments about what might happen with the reduction of aerosols and future extreme events. It's something very much worth reading. I will circulate it and hopefully we'll put it up on our website. I've shared the link in the chat box. That website has some recordings of past talks, future talks, some basic material, and sort of papers organized by different disciplines. Uh, and that's open access for all teachers and students. So thank you all of you once again for joining in today. This is the last talk of the year. Uh, wish you a Merry Christmas, a Happy New Year, and hope we all have a safe and healthy 2021. And thank you once again, Professor Allen. We hope you continue to be in touch, and thank you. Bye-bye. Goodbye now. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you, Miles. Thanks. Really appreciate your taking so much time. It was brilliant, as usual. Great. Great. Well, thank you very much indeed. Yes. Right.